Right, here we go. So yeah, uh, th uh, thanks to, to Yuris for being here today. And uh, we have some special announcement from Yuris. Uh, so that will be uh, after the traditional update on the latest Siebel update. So bear with me, uh, this will be a short one. As uh, 24.3, as you might have heard already or looked in the documentation release notes, is a bug fix only release. As have, have been the first three releases in 2024, haven't introduced really a lot of excitement, but uh, that, that would tell us to stay tuned for more in, in the future releases maybe. So, and I will also talk about training. Uh, the Siebel Hub, of course, is the number one training provider still. <laughs> I just checked. And we will have, uh, we are having live trainings uh, in starting in April. So that's coming up. Uh, one feature I found, so I'm always looking for, if you will, Easter eggs in new Siebel releases. And that's a very small one. But did you know that... Uh, actually, there is a portion of Bookshelf always delivered with your Siebel server. <laughs> so, and that portion is the Siebel Tools Online Help, which is the not the PDFs, but the HTML or, a, uh, well, maybe a, a little little bit different HTML version of it. And that is delivered onto your AIs on your web servers. And when you go to Web Tools and open Online Help in Web Tools, it always comes up with the application help unless you have 24.3 and higher, then it now opens the Siebel Tools Online Help. So that was maybe a bug that Oracle fixed. And now you can use the bookshelf guides from your local web server, if you will. Don't have to go to bookshelf on the internet, but that of course is still an option. So there's that. There's a little bit of news there. And then or we Siebel have- Siebel Tools. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you just sang your praises of Siebel tools. And um, of course, it comes with documentation. So uh, and yeah, now I have to rewind a little bit to 23.11. Uh, there's something that I missed, honestly, on in Bookshelf. As Bookshelf gets updated without often, you know, setting the revised flag these days. And so many chapters getting slightly subtly updated. I can't reread Bookshelf every every month. And this came up then on Oracle support and with a customer of mine where Oracle said it's now mandatory to use for Windows servers to use the Tomcat for outbound EAI. Uh, so what, what does this mean? What's the diagram saying here? So um, that's a diagram that focuses on the outbound architecture for EAI on Windows. If you are on a release 23.10 or earlier, uh, as you might know, if you do anything involving the letter J, <laughs> like JMS or JBS, Java Business Services, or use a proxy outbound dispatcher uh, for REST, that's the generated one when you import uh, your Swagger files. Then the requests go from that Siebel server on Windows to the server indicated by that profile or named subsystem, Java 64. And that usually points to the Siebel slash JBS servlet on the SCS Tomcat, the Tomcat that's adjacent to the Siebel server. And then this one makes the, the code on this one makes the actual physical connection. So that's on every operating system, Linux, Unix, Windows, that's the same. But Windows is special Un until 23.10. Any other HTTP transport, including the native business service calls to HTTP transport and the SOAP proxy, which also is a typically HTTP transport in the background, uses the Win inet the windows internet net thingy so it it makes a direct connection from the windows shell if you will to the external application not using the tomcat that's a big difference in the windows based architecture okay 
And now fast forward to 23.11, where Oracle actually introduced the ability to use another servlet, which, um, yeah, Nick, you use Linux servers, you probably know that servlet, right? Outbound EAI. Yeah. Which is in yeah. a second profile uh, called Outbound SHA2, hinting towards the encryption that is possible through that through that uh, channel. And so on Windows, this is now possible to use. So I tested that using a recent version of Siebel and yeah, Windows starts using that servlet. So you have traffic going through your SES Tomcat like on Linux or, or Unix. So which is kind of Oracle's intention to streamline the outbound EAI architecture. And that happened a few months ago already. So this is the rewind we're having. It's a bit confusing though, as Oracle support says, it's now mandatory to use. And Bookshelf says it's a new option. <laughs> so uh, not sure what it is. Definitely both work, the old, uh, the old and new style on Windows. Yeah, that outbound shop profile, the only way you can attach it to any of your AOMs is through the command line. You can't do it on the GUI. Oh, you mean set the uh, set the uh, parameter? The, the yep, e set that up on parameter. You can only do it in the command line. It does not allow you on the GUI at all. Uh, okay, because I set it on the GUI in Windows. Well, I'm Linux. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, either, yeah, you have to point to that subsystem, uh, of course, in a parameter as as you do pointing to subsystems. Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a change that is subtle, but again, s stirred up some customers. One of my customers, they were really anxious about up updating to twenty four point two because they read on Oracle support it's mandatory, and what does this mean? And so, yeah, I decided to give that a rewind. Uh, so that because, also means you're going to have to put the certificates in the JKS file instead of just in the Windows. And most Im store. most importantly, the 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 certificates of the external application, the root uh, the root certificate authority uh, and intermediate, they have to go into yes, correct the uh, internal Tomcat JKS trust store. Yeah, and. Back, back in the Windows time, when, when it was through Windows, of course, it was has to be in the Windows Trust Store, which is uh, through the Windows registry. Yeah. So that is the change you have to make. You have to, when you migrate Windows, when you want to migrate to this inter integration architecture on your Windows servers, you have a few steps to, to make and test carefully. Okay, so... And yeah, big big news as well in March, uh, as is the tradition in March. I would <laughs> I would say uh, is that Oracle extends their premier support for on-premise or uh, applications unlimited. Uh, that includes, of course, Siebel CRM and four others. And those customers who are on a continuous innovation release, which in case of Siebel means. 18.5 or higher, so that's when continuous innovation started. You get premier support through at least December 2035 when we all retired. <laughs> 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 Actually, 2035 is my retirement year, so I have 11 years to go. And that's good news, of course, for the customers, and everybody's pretty excited that, again, it was extended for one year, and of course, I'm I'm very sure it will be extended next year for another year, so why not? It's it's a good uh, those applications unlimited products together. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but I would say each of them, if you have five, <laughs> you can put a billion dollars behind each of them, and you have a total revenue, which is roughly roughly the revenue Oracle makes from these five applications, uh, which is bit more than they make in cloud, right? So that <laughs> makes you think. Okay. Uh, so yeah, anything to say about this change? Sounds okay. good. The announcement, yeah. So of course it's all over the social networks and LinkedIn and 
now now on the Siebel Hub as well. Uh, yeah, we all know about the continuous release model. I just put a slide up here to, to remind people what it means. So if you're on IP 14, 15, 16, or IP 17, which I, I hope nobody is, <laughs> uh, you're not getting that extension uh, because you're not on a continuous innovation release, uh, starting with 18 and of course going up the way to the latest, you're on a continuous innovation release. And speaking of continuous innovation, I put together this slide for a speech I did in uh, London at Oracle Cloud World at the Product Council. And it's easy to belittle, let's say, releases like 24.3, uh, where you say, okay, there's, there's, there's just bug fixes, there's no features, um, Oracle, Oracle is getting tired of releasing features. It's not true. Uh, if you consider the last how much is this? Uh, 12, 13, uh, 15 months, 15 months. Uh, then there's a, there's a bunch of innovation happened in, in those 15 months or let's say over the past year, if you wind back one year, it's actually hard to, to put it all on a single slide. I, I had to cheat a little bit and remove some stuff, uh, and look at the integration, uh, row, if you will, um, oh, a lot of the features are related to integration, kind of highlighting the importance of integrate. Siebel is always integrated with other environments, uh, does, dozens or even hundreds of interfaces. And that includes the famous Kafka event publication subscription 23.6 or the, the dynamic integration objects. Uh, and yeah, Kafka got an update recently with uh, support for SASL Scram the authentication for Kafka. Uh, web tools gets a lot of attention, as you can see. Uh, and then I put a category other, I put all the other stuff that Oracle put, put in over the last 15 months. And I also put in the Tomcat version, which got increased in 24.3, by the way, I forgot that. <laughs> so uh, 9, 9085 is the current Tomcat. Uh, so yeah, so Oracle throws in a new Tomcat almost monthly or every sec every other month. Uh, any anything that catches your eyes here that you you deem particularly important for for your project? No nope. integration mostly. The the whole integration uh section, yeah. Okay, so and, tools. <laughs> and and if you look if you look carefully, there's kind of a pattern. There's uh, less integration towards the end of the year, like beginning and end of the year, and a lot of integration in the middle of, yeah, starting in May, uh, May to September. So uh, that that of course is, uh, I think Brian uh, mentioned it in one Siebel Friday, uh, releases like January, February, March. They are developed in, well, typically three months ahead. So they fall within the winter, November, December, where there's a lot of holidays. So they wind down a little bit and then they take up speed. Right now they're taking up speed for, well, hopefully uh, some nice releases coming up in 24. Dot, well, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I guess there's a lot coming. I'm just speculating. I, I hope there will be an, a surge of features <laughs> as usual. Um, okay, and Nick mentioned, uh, you mentioned it uh, at the beginning that we have a live online learning class up. Uh, I started a series of live online learnings with myself uh, doing 90 minute sessions uh, twice a week. So that's uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And the next one is starting on 9th April and it has eight sessions. So it goes until the 2nd of May, but there's two sessions per week, uh, two 90 minute sessions at the same time on Tuesday, Thursday. There's a page uh, we can visit, of course. Uh, let me go there. Can visit that page, uh, which is the registration page. So I also put a link for those who watch the replay in the description. Um, so here you see that 
until 2nd of April, there's an early bird pass. For a very reasonable price, you get those 12 hours of training, live, live sessions, plus replays, plus PDFs. <laughs> so really try to put make a very uh, attractive package here. And you can book individual sessions um, if you want. You can also book the full eight sessions. And it's all about modern EAI, starting with architecture and integration overview, but then going quickly into uh, REST. We have three hours dedicated to REST. We have 90 minutes dedicated to Kafka, OCI, AI integration. We have DISA and performance tuning. So a lot of interesting chapters there. So please feel free to talk about it share it within your organization. So the early bird covers all those classes? Uh, the early bird pass covers all eight sessions, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so you save a lot of money when you do the early bird. <laughs> uh, instead, uh, compared to buying the indiv eight individual sessions. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, there, there's that. So I'm looking forward to that training. It's uh, really fun to do live trainings. Uh, I always enjoyed it. And since I started 30 years ago, I did my first live training. Uh, it had nothing to do with IT, funny enough, but then again, who knows what comes next. And yeah, who knows what comes next? <laughs> yeah, so Yuris, before, before I hand over the mic to you, uh, I'll just talk about events where Juris and I and um, other people that you know from the ecosystem will be in, in April. So there is a plan. It's planned currently, but the registration page is out. Uh, a live event in Stockholm. So if you're in the Nordics, that of course is interesting. Uh, and the, the day after on 18th April, there's a live event in Helsinki. So we're doing a Nordics tour. Uh, talking about Siebel and AI, Siebel on OCI, Siebel on Kubernetes, Siebel and Intelligent Advisor with Richard Napier also being there. So the full, the full Siebel Hub team, <laughs> Richard and I, uh, will be there. And also Oracle will demonstrate or talk about the Redwood UX they, they've been building for Siebel. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting topics. If you follow those links, which I'll... I'll put in the description of the recorded video and the later we'll put in the chat so you can pick up the links to register. There's also a virtual event that Oracle has announced. Uh, they now call these events uh, the product council. So there's a spring product council in on 25 April, a, a virtual event where, where everybody can of course join from across uh, the globe. Did you notice Alex that it's like the length is two hours, which the is, the product, unusual, I think. Yeah. the product counts, the, the virtual one is, is two yeah. hours. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, okay. Because usually this like customer advisory board sessions, they are one hour, but this one is like two hours. Yeah, it's probably a oh, lot oh, to talk about. Yeah, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe they have some big announcements. Yeah, let's see. There's <laughs> definitely some, some stir and some movement. Uh, it's tangible. Right. Okay. So, yeah, Yuris, um, if, if uh, I hand over to you for right. the presentation, so I think, can you share? Yes. Yes, oh. I can try to share. It's uh, working for me. Good. Okay. Here you go, Yuris. Um, oh, okay. So can anyone see my screen? Or ever yes. Everyone? Yes. yes, we can. Yeah, good. All right. Yeah, so... Um, uh, you know, the reason um, we kind of agreed, Alex, that uh, I joined this Siebel Friday session, or it's the good Siebel Friday session, uh, is that uh, our company, Idea Portriga, is outsourcing its Magnet AI. So basically kind of a set of tools to enable AI across different CRM platforms uh, provided for like open source for community uh, and there is like certain timeline which i will touch uh, later um yeah and effectively today i'll just touch a few points so one is you know for those who are not familiar what is magnet ai and what is capable of now 
So what are the features we have in the roadmap? How can uh, each of you contribute to that if you're interested? And also, as I mentioned, there will be some kind of timeline to open sourcing it. It's not going to happen in one goal, but we'll kind of gradually expand the, the group of people we are working uh, with together. <clears throat> Again, uh, in, in short, uh, we built Magnet AI so that different customers and partners could uh, uh, use it to easily incorporate generative AI functionality into their Siebel CRM. So, and right now we're looking at Salesforce where Think of the, the the best integration we have available. Then we look also at uh, Salesforce uh, right now, Fusion and, and ServiceNow. Um, and basically, you know, the way we started was that, of course, when uh, Chat GPT got a lot of uh, traction and everybody would talk to it, so we tried it ourselves. Uh, then we realized that there is like APIs available for OpenAI, so we did some API stuff. But obviously, then you get like a lot of questions regarding security, how they integrate, are your data safe, uh, what OpenAI is doing with them, um, you know, how can I actually get the responses uh, from uh, ChatGPT, which are related to my company, and all, all these sort of things. And again, Taking typical enterprise concern into account, uh, we have sort of developed a set of tools. And now what we have currently is a kind of administrator panel where you have uh, different prompt templates, and I will show them all in, in a minute. Uh, then um, if we want to do Q&A uh, on different knowledge sources that, that we have, if there's some materials or something else, uh, then in generative AI world, there is this thing called vector embeddings. And I think kind of Alex covered uh, those uh, in his earlier sessions as well, uh, doing some demos. And uh, kind of another part that, that we have is sort of AI panel, which is embedded into uh, hosting application UI, for example, into Siebel. And, and, and we kind of try to make it now more configurable so that it can perform half automatically, you know, many different tasks again, all, all having some AI uh, features behind it. Then of course uh, we have um, ability to integrate with that through API. So we can call, uh, we use like prompt templates via API, do semantic search and then retrieval augmented generation. Okay, there are some questions. Okay, it's links from Alex, all right. Um, yeah, and and then uh, we have this AI panel that I mentioned. So currently it is just UGS code, which is uh, basically the technology we use to build them. Uh, so all, all the logic is uh, written like a backend logic uh, written on the Python and, and we're using like one of the famous autogen frameworks for this ages development. And, and then um, some configuration can be done through administrative panel, but, um, or administrative UI, but this is like a big area we are trying to make more configurable and like low code as, as possible as we can. So I think with that, I'll just do some demos unless you have any questions. And, and, and like, if you have questions, just start talking and I will stop because I, I'm, I don't see anyone and, um, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so this is, um, uh, again, admin, yeah, maybe I'll start with Siebel first. It will be better. Okay, um, so for example, uh, here we have like a typical Siebel uh, we all familiar with. Uh, one area that I wanted to kind of show uh, is related to ability to call APIs. So uh, let me just find one of them. Okay, I, I, I think I'll just take it so I don't really care what is in there. Okay, so uh, for example, if, oh, maybe I'll start that way. So here are some incoming email that I have. 
Uh, I'll take uh, one, uh, for example, someone asking to send me the details uh, of, of, of the agreement for whatever reason. So I create like a service request uh, and drill down into it. So there are some values which are pre-defaulted, uh, but effectively what uh, we want to do, we want to look into the inbound email text uh, and then, um, you know, do, run some AI over it and get some responses back. So, and effectively here, we just added like this one button, which is doing exactly that. So first it, it, it determined that they are talking about subscriptions, then they uh, have like identified positive sentiment in this email. I, I don't know why, but uh, okay, it's positive. Maybe because people say thank you very much, something. Uh, then uh, they did like a quick summary. What was it all about? Uh, and then we did like a description. So what what customer wants us to do and and what they have asked for. So and if, and if you look at this email itself, so it's like really short. Uh, I got multiple description. Can you send me the details? This is what I need to have. Okay. So, and, and basically here, what happened is that um, behind this button, there is uh, a REST service call, uh, which is invoking uh, one of our um, templates. And I'll just go here. So this was this categorized template. Uh, so if you're kind of familiar with the, with the prompts a little bit, then so basically we kind of give instructions first saying that, okay, you are like AI agent, a uh, customer will provide you with three inputs. So email, sentiment, list of values, and request type list of values. Because again, we need to sort of populate correctly list of values that, that are in Siebel. So we kind of try to get this information into the model so that it's correctly finds like the closest one semantically. Yeah, and then uh, we say that, okay, you, you, you need to analyze this and create a JSON file with four parameters. Uh, some fun instructions that you need to have. Uh, and then, you know, there will be summary with the background title, concise name, uh, SR type, you know, pick closest from what is coming, and then also identify the sentiment. So, and um, also here we have like a testing facility. So if I want to see how this whole thing performs, so let me just get some kind of sample. Uh, text here <clears throat> and effectively this, this is the, the result so basically from Siebel we expect this text with the four or three inputs right and then it, it provides you the output taking care of all this like natural language understanding and and, and processing uh, the backgrounds so here you can also kind of play a little bit with uh, with what kind of model you can use so we're using you know 3.5 turbo because it's the fastest. So if I try, for example, um, GPT-4, and you will see that it is not iceably slower. Uh, that's why also like our agents demo is kind of takes a bit more time. It provides better answers, but it still uh, gives more time. And you can see it's like also gives like different um, outputs as well. So here like sentiment is neutral. Um, and um, this is what happens. And then also we have like another um, so prompt for this demo, uh, which is basically the user will provide you with the correspondence between the customer, uh, the customer in our company, create a summary of it, keep the English uh, language and, and make summary 150 words uh, max. <clears throat> okay, and I go back to Siebel. Uh, so here I will need to find one of these maybe um, completed emails with outbound email. So here is like the, the latest outbound email, uh, which is in Finnish, uh, explaining some stuff. Okay. Um, okay, go back. Uh, and then if I'll just um, change the status to open, remove description. So like we generated initial description, right? When the service request was created, but now everything is done. So we need to sort of update uh, the detailed description. So, and again, here I click this <clears throat> open AI demo. 
I think we changed the model to four uh, GPT-4, so it will take a bit more time. Actually, nothing will happen. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, uh, my mistake. <laughs> what I needed to do, I need just to finish uh, to complete the service request. So that's that's what needs what I needed to do. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so basically, when the status changed, uh, there was like a runtime event fired, and and then this runtime event, you know basically populated this um, description. And now it's not only about what customers wanted us to do, but we also added what kind of response uh, we provided to the person. And again, since original email was in, in, in Finnish and, and we asked it to be in English because we're like operating in English language. So it kind of did this translation uh, as well. So basically this is like to show this maybe API functionality where you can, uh, you know, define stuff uh, or different prompts in 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 the tool uh, in in Magnet AI, and then you can, you know, through simple REST services, uh, call it, and you can make it kind of more manageable. You can test it upfront with different kind of data, keep the history of all, all the runs and and things like that. All right, and uh, and then uh, uh, another item that I wanted to show you from demo point of view. Um, is related to the different agents. Again, let me find my demo emails. Uh, so, for example, here is like uh, some asking for okay email so okay, okay basically we can you know build a lot of buttons in, into Siebel and, and so that the user knows like when they need to go where and what they need to click and stuff like that which is fine but we also want to sort of kind of speed it up a little bit and and, and that's why we are building all the different um, <clears throat> agents so um, one kind of simple example here is that is that the Maria is asking to change the phone number okay and finish this one so, and what I do now, I just took this email, I, um, I, I launched the agent. So again, first, what, what the agent did is like, because it's sort of kind of natively integrated with OpenAI, we know exactly in which view we are and in what um, record we, we are positioned, right? So it knows the context of it. So therefore we are able to identify the contact person. Uh, then again, by looking at the email, we understood that email was in English. Uh, it was about account access. Sentiment is neutral. If we want to, we can see uh, inbound email as well. And then um, what we do here is that uh, we have a configuration, which I will kind of show you in a minute, um, which has like a description of different type of let's put it this way, actions we can do, you know, maybe like what kind of APIs we can talk. And then also for each particular API, uh, we can sort of configure what form we want, we want it to be. So uh, in this case, what it, it told that, okay, I looked at the email, uh, it looks like um, I need to call this service called set the contact information. And, you know, these are the fields. Okay, it looks like I've been testing before, so uh, I changed the, the work number as well uh, before. So I, I changed it like to, to back to 555. So what is happening now is that uh, we are calling the service based on the inputs uh, that are provided. So our environment is a bit slow, sorry, it's like taking some time. And, and then basically it says that, okay, hey, uh, based on the steps I have, did the changes. I don't know why it say that we also kind of changed cell phone number and email address. So something to, to, we need to kind of fine tune here a little bit, but effectively, yes, I, I did the changes that you asked me for. And then I can kind of send an email and um, generate the service request. So, um, okay. It, didn't go where I wanted it to go. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> so navigation is not working. Okay, fine. OK. 
okay. And somehow I kind of got lost with this uh, service request ID because I think something, well, anyway, something kind of went wrong here because typically I would have this uh, service request also credit summarized, but it didn't happen um, in this case. Okay. Don't, don't worry, Yuris. It's a yeah. live demo. After yeah, it's all, live demo, which yeah. we appreciate very much, and it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and um, then what we kind of maybe if we go back to yeah, what I'll, I'll try to do is like uh, so this is like uh, one of the requests in Latvian. So it says like, "Hi, I have several agreements, and I want to extend them until the." next March, something, or next March of next year. So let's try again. I, I just want to show like how we can configure things uh, here and there. Okay, a agent is, is, is looking, uh, is, is using GPT-4, so it's a bit slow. Um, but again, here it did like a summary, what, what the user wanted. So this is how like original email in, in Latvian, this is how it got uh, translated. So now it's supposed to find uh, like the service to, to deal with that and, and the form. Yeah, and, and basically it says, okay, uh, I have found like these agreements uh, and in, in this setup, it is done so that you can kind of mark which of the records you want to be affected. And then you kind of set the date, um, not exactly what they asked for, but still. So, and then I kind of confirm. And then basically, uh, if we'll go to the record of this Maria Cooper, she will have this uh, three agreements and, and one of them will get uh, updated. And then again, the same uh, flow will continue that, uh, you know, based on your input, I did this and that, and this is like the outcome. But let's see what the email is, and, and then we can create like a SR and stuff. Okay, update is done successfully. So like a simple part is over. Yeah, well, <laughs> basically it says, okay, I have done update for the agreement. Probably we, we had to give them the name, not the ID, uh, which is again, still a few things to fine tune uh, in the kind of real life scenario. Now the data is this. Yeah, and um, and then I, and I go and finish it. So, and then if I return to, um, to my uh, kind of configuration UI. So here I have like, a, basically service uh, set agreements, uh, which is um, the one actually doing doing the work. So we had to create it like in um, OpenAI 3, OpenAPI 3.0 format. Um, and, and then it's like used in this agent and basically it just like, uh, you know, get some content for the UI element, it shows some kind of dates, to output format, it's I, I name and, and, and the number of the agreement, you know, some of the text you see. And for example, if I want uh, to have a ability to update the um, record <clears throat> one by one, so I kind of change the configuration here. Uh, I can also sort of play with this uh, tool like right from here. So I just need to kind of show uh, the email ID I, I'm trying to process. Okay, so I kind of type it in here. So, and, and now we're kicking off this uh, whole whole thing. So basically, you know, the source system here was Siebel. So we have like a connection string configured. So, and then effectively without going into Siebel, uh, you can test it from here because uh, again, it's just UI. Uh, we can have it like in different places, right? So, and, and then once we change this configuration, it is still picking up the service, right? But then I can like for each individual uh, item, I can go and, and, and set different 
values, right? So it's like, I'm not updating all the agreements I have selected with the same data set, but I kind of do it like one by one. Um, yeah, and also since uh, we have like kind of memory, if you will, for this agent, so somewhere behind like all the calls we're making and, and how this like different agents trying to understand what needs to be done, it is all here. And when we do, this is like how we pick the API, um, this is like the UI. And then if I do confirm, I can also see that, um, okay. I think I, I called like Siebel service with this data. So it returned me something in return that update was successful done. And then I'm kind of generating uh, kind of other steps, which this agent is doing. So uh, from that point of view, it, it's also sort of um, kind of testable, if you will. And this is how it would look for the, for the UI, uh, for the end user. Um, okay, and um, kind of another big part uh, of every AI, or at least this is like one of the simpler use cases when every, how everyone can start is that let's say we have like uh, this Q&A uh, feature enabled. So for example, and, and, and here we can sort of embed or do this vector embedding for different type of documents and, and they are located in different places. So like, you know, SharePoint is one which is commonly used. This is like the integration we have built. So also we've done one with Confluence, uh, then another one with uh, Salesforce knowledge bases. But this is uh, for this like uh, sort of collection uh, called Primex, it's like a company here is um, we're use, they're using SharePoint and they're using some videos for, for training. So like how to add budget to opportunity. I think I'm I'm not working on the project. I don't know details, but uh, opportunity. Hope it's kind of relevant. So again, you know, as Alexander was explained before as well, so that uh, effectively what, what is happening is that we have all these knowledge articles somewhere so we have to go and do what is called vector embedding, basically transform the text into the array of load numbers. Um, so depending on what kind of embedding service you use, it's it could be like 400 or it can be like really big one, like 4,000. Uh, typical open AI, ADA is, it has like about 1,500 uh, or something uh, of these numbers. And, and then when we ask a question, it again converts a question to the same vector. Then it does this similarity search. So basically looking for the articles which semantically are the closest to what the question was about. And then uh, we do this like last step, which is generation. So like we had retrieval, right? So when we searched for that, and then we want to generate and we kind of augment this retrieval uh, with the generation with the data we retrieved. So we kind of pass along. So we make a query to open AI or running like a prompt to large language model, not just open AI, but, but any saying that, okay, please answer this question using the text, which is provided below. And, and then uh, in our example, what happened is that it found like a few videos and, and there is like the trick behind it, uh, like how do I add new budget? So if, if the user, I can kind of go and play and, and maybe I want to open it like in, in stream. So that's like full, uh, full screen experience and I see more. Okay. Uh, uh, but, but then it's also sort of took the, 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 the information in, in all these little uh, pieces of uh, knowledge, right? And it kind of combined the articles. So you have to select like a proper opportunity, click new budget, put all the required uh, um, fields and press save. And if you want to see that, you know, these are like some movies uh, which start at particular place uh, of this movie. So, and then again, the way how we manage it is that uh, we call this like collections. 
So for this like a premix one, which we showed to you, uh, there were like a few different uh, chunks of these videos, you know, they were like really, really small. And then there is some metadata available, like uh, how we would call this title, what is the name of the video, where I can get this video, uh, how do I play it, from which minute and stuff. Um, yeah, and and then I can also kind of go back. So let's say this is like the details, but like uh, in the first time when I kind of configure this collection, I'm saying that, okay, I'm giving it name. This is like internal uh, database, it's kind of knowledge base. Uh, do I want to show it in the Q&A or not? So basically if I say yes, then it will typically these agents will show collections. Uh, on the UI, like here, I have all those which are yes. Um, yeah, and and then I indicate what is the source type, like for example, SharePoint. It could be something else as well. What and and then for every source type, I am uh, I, I need to kind of give address or maybe specify some other information. And bef behind like every configuration of this a source type, there are a few more tricks because obviously you know accessing all your company SharePoint sites. Nobody kind of will allow you to do that, even though if you go to the open source project, that's exactly the approach. So we kind of figured out an approach how you can configure access to particular sites only. So it's kind of more secure. Um, yeah, and, and, and then for example, for Salesforce or Confluence, if you use the knowledge base, they have like a different mechanisms how you can connect. Uh, and, and this is what we have built now. So effectively, if I kind of go on and start like a new collection, I, I give it a name, I, I say what what is the what is that the type? Um and, and then I just for different types uh, give give like uh, some credentials that I need and then I create it. So when I create it then it, it sort of uh, does or yeah it, it creates uh the collection as we call uh here which is just like um now it, it is like, like in uh in Cosmos DB, uh, like a collection of documents, if you will. And then when it's created, uh, I can, um, you know, do the synchronization so that I run this embedding process uh, from beginning to the end. And, and then we can also sort of schedule this refresh, like, like we do with ETL, for example, right? So that, you know, please do this refresh every every night for example just to make sure that uh, the information the sharepoints and confluences whatever other sources we have is like up to date with what we have indexed so that we can kind of serve right answers uh, uh, to the users yeah so and again uh, like if i go here uh, to this site um, i'll just kind of wait here so this is like a, a normal SharePoint. So yeah, I could kind of go and, and try to update the data just to show that uh, this uh, sync works, but but it does. Um, okay, um, but to ensure this is uh, what we have uh, at this moment. So what we, <clears throat> yeah, maybe it was like my mistake. I kind of keep forgetting about it. About this email flow just, so I hope you were able to follow along, uh, but to maybe to recap it is, you know, first what we did, we just, Took the email we called large language model to help us to understand the sentiment to define category and summarize the content then again we decided like what action should i take is it like should i call api or should i use just general knowledge base because sometimes it's just like frequently asked questions that uh, that can help uh, to solve customer problem then we do this execution part so if it's a uh, read API or knowledge base search. So we just sort of run this and, and that's it. But let's say if we expect the user to update some of the data, so we provide them with the form, uh, then of course we ask to confirm that they, hey, you really want to update it, then they do update. Um, and then uh, things happen. Uh, once this uh, action is executed, we are drafting email, you know, based on uh, the original request and what we've done. And then we do this like summary, which didn't go like super well for us. Okay, question. Uh, yes, I will, Alex, of course. 
Uh, okay, this is like a bit about architecture. Uh, so again, we have like a front end, which is administrator tool and the panel. Then there is a back end. This is written in Vue.js. This is like in Python. Then uh, to to do the embeddings, uh, then we have the different knowledge bases. And there's like service which is doing that uh, depending on the type. So now we have integrations with Confluence, SharePoint, ServiceNow, uh, Salesforce, and we will be adding ServiceNow and right now. If somebody has something else, uh, we can also look into that. Then uh, we kind of how we embed this panel into different UIs. So Salesforce, uh, Sybil is working. These are coming. Currently it's running all on Azure, but we're thinking about Oracle uh, as well, and maybe on premise for like more secure, uh, with a higher like demand for security. Like, you, you know, some companies want to run it on-prem. Okay, to deploy it now, uh, all you need to have is like Azure instance. Uh, and if you have like Azure, it is, uh, we're using standard managed Azure services for that. So like backend is running in the container. Then we have Cosmos DB for storing embeddings, you know, some Azure open AI uh, collections. And then UI is just like static replication. So it's like storage account is all we need. Yeah, and uh, going forward, uh, what we wanna do is so we want to still kind of improve this retrieval augmented generation piece. So, you know, there are some kind of technical tricks you can do in order to improve the quality. Uh, we want to implement them. Then of course, like also for other prompts, we want to be able to evaluate, let's say if we change the prompt, is it getting better on like typical questions we're asking or actually the answer degrades. Uh, so we wanted like to have environment where we can pre-run it before putting it out there. So caching is one thing, analytics, you know, who is asking the questions, what kind of questions are there, are we re responding to them or not? And then maybe we'll look at the database records embedding. So let's say if we have all the solutions in the Siebel database, then maybe we can kind of uh, use it for embeddings as well. Okay, agents, so we want to make it more configurable. Uh, maybe we'll think also about like how to make uh, it run on the background because we have this sort of long-term memory enabled and like to speed up the experience that you know I could start on the background processing one of the inbound activity. If it's like uh, read-only, I can just get the data and when the user open it, it already has the last step when they need to send an email. Or if it's like some inputs I needed, so it will be on the step when inputs is needed, just to speed it up a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, maybe kind of we try to do with this email processing to be to do more complex stuff like um, not just a happy pass when there is like one email coming up and we are answering it, but sometimes we need more information, so we request it. Sometimes we're not just like canceling subscription, but we need to retain. So how do we do that? And uh, as you saw, that oftentimes users are providing some like valuable inputs in the email. And we should be able to extract them and, and use them the input in different forms. For example, in the subscription example, the person asked uh, they wanted to extend it until certain date. So we could actually go and populate uh, the fields already uh, just by looking at what the user asked for. Yeah, and another thing is like OCI. So again, uh, enablement of uh, Gen AI services, not just Azure Open AI, but uh, Oracle. Uh, same for the vector store, it's either 23C or MySQL Heatwave. Maybe we'll host it also in Azure and maybe we'll kind of redwood AI panel a little bit. Yeah, and speaking of uh, contribution, so it's like, okay, the, the code is, is going to be published and uh, you can go ahead and do whatever you want with that. So you can deploy it in your own environment. You can um, fork it and continue development on your own. But of course, we also would like that you kind of contribute something to that. So, but few things you can do uh, is that, okay, uh, experiment with the tool. And I think kind of early on, we will be providing our own Azure instance so that you can sort of uh, play it a little bit uh, in non-production environment, or you can kind of run it in your own Azure instance. Again, giving us the feedback about the features and the roadmap is in, kind of would be really great. You have some particular use cases that you want us to tackle um, Again, very terrific uh, input that we we'll look for. 
obviously help with uh, with the coding itself. So either with the core functionality or help us to integrate with OCI. Uh, I think we have like a partner who will help us to integrate with right now, but we're looking for some help with service now and the Fusion applications. You know, documentation is a big thing. But of course, if you, you know, uh, also present uh, this uh, solution to your business stakeholders, we would appreciate it and we can all kind of jump in and, and help. And when we'll have some updates, social media, you know, you can also share. And, and what comes to the timeline? So again, now we are at the end of March. So we still need to clean it up a little bit, simplify deployment uh, so that we can spin up like different customer instances easily. And, and we have like uh, two ongoing POCs in process. So we want to finish them just to see that it's working in production. Um, then in the mid-March, uh, we will open it to all of those who are eager to contribute. So for example, Alex, if you are eager to contribute, we will open it uh, with you, to you uh, and, and a few other folks. Um, then, um, then maybe at the end of May, so in, in two months, we will open it to kind of a larger group of partners and customers, you know, primarily like whom we know and, and basically kind of Siebel ecosystem and, and maybe a bit larger than that. Yeah, and then maybe at the end of the August, if everything is going fine, then we open it to the generic public and, and try to promote uh, as well. Yeah, and if you are interested to participate, this is my email. So you just out stadiaportriga.com and, and that's it for me. Oh, Alex, wrong, look, okay. it's like sharp, sharp nine o'clock, uh, oh, seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, wow. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I I have to pick up my jaw from the floor, as they say. <laughs> uh, that was an incredible live demo and content. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we are, have reached the hour, so we see people are dropping off. But uh, yeah, this will all be recorded and available on YouTube in uh, in a few days uh, with all the links. So Yuris, if you have any uh, links you want me to put in the description or, you know. I think just email address and that's it. So I can just, also kind of leave my uh, LinkedIn profile, for example. That's yeah, LinkedIn and email I'll put in the description of YouTube. So you're you're happy to to have this on a public YouTube page, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if you do LinkedIn, it should be fine. Maybe maybe not email, but LinkedIn because yeah, all LinkedIn. the descriptions they are like automatically processed and you don't know where it's end up. Yeah, right? yeah, I I know that from you know uh, that. from experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was horrifying that time, Alex. So like, yeah. but but you managed it, so it continued yeah. in five minutes. In different oh, yeah. Okay. So, hey, Juris. Yes. What Nick? what are, what type of info are you looking for for service now? Yeah. Okay. It's a good question because. Um, mm. What they kind of experienced is that uh, customers, they are not really eager to put it live in, to work with like real end users or real customers. So they're a bit hesitant. However, if you say, how about like your help desk? You know, you have like a, a users which are putting a lot of uh, requests to IT help desk, right? And you know, all these problems are repetitive and you know, please restart your computer is like a very standard answer you know, sometimes they would give or like uh, clear cache and restart the browser or whatever, right? So, and 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 we were just thinking that the same way how we did this like in, in our demo end user or end customer uh, requests processing, we can do the same with IT, with, with, uh, with IT help desk. And this is uh, basically what we'll have is that uh, in service now, you know, this panel is also going to be embedded uh, and and then this is what we kind of look for that somebody could provide us with uh, with this like service now instance where we could play uh, with and but I think I will you know get it sorted with one of our clients who are interested to put this AI panel into their service now to facilitate first the resolution of all the Siebel tickets or Siebel requests that are coming from the users. Uh, and and then maybe kind of to expand it a little bit, but but service now is like an instance and processing the internal IT help desk requests of, of, from the users. So this is the the use case we want to implement, and I think we are 
we can kind of we can reuse a lot of what is built uh, as well. Okay, because what I do now is I integrate Siebel into ServiceNow and create tickets. Okay, interesting. And uh, how you do that? Uh, through uh, you know Rust APIs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, ServiceNow like provides. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good idea. It's like for the same uh, customer, which is our favorite one uh, from the Nordics. Uh, uh, which we're going to visit uh, in middle of uh, April uh, with Alexander. So basically for them, we have like, we'll have a panel, which will have just Q&A um, on Siebel uh, handbook, if you will. And, and then they will have ability also to create a ticket. If let's say they didn't find the answer and they want to go to, a, to IT help desk, then um, they will do that. But for now, we will just send an email so that like ServiceNow picks it up and, and also provide some context like, okay, who was the user on which view they were, uh, on which record. And also um, maybe we can get something from this like web console so that, you know, somebody could like have some idea what, what went wrong, like where the errors. But, but, but how was the integration with ServiceNow, like REST service, did it go fine? Because still you have it to know all the to... different LOVs and stuff, like what to provide, but. Oh yeah, it, it's a big setup because they yeah. use, when the integration, they use, actually use sys IDs. And you okay. have to figure out what the sys ID is before you can create the ticket. Okay. Yeah, that's why I think we just went through this like more simple route when we just create an email, send it out and let uh, the first line support sort it. And again, maybe with the AI, we can do this triaging uh, right up front. So at least to understand, you know, what queue should go to and stuff like that. Yeah. So but let's see. <clears throat> uh, I'll bring it up to the share. The uh, It's not my team. It's another group in another part of the company. Yeah. I'll, I'll show them what this was yeah. if they're interested. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay, right. Good, good to see. You. And yeah, I feel a little bit sorry that this is the Good Friday, Siebel Friday, where the only few people have seen this <laughs> incredible. So the chosen uh, ones, huh, Alex? The chosen <laughs> ones. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure people will will watch the video. A lot of people, as as they were eager to tell me, move the Siebel Friday to another day. I say I can't. <laughs> it's Siebel Friday, right? <laughs> uh, so, but uh, of course, Yuris, we can we can repeat this. Um, any any time, and uh, yeah, you will do this a lot in in April on in Stockholm and Helsinki, I guess. I, yeah, I have... but I think Alex also like what we could do is you know when when let's say when uh, example some of our Oracle colleagues or like start yeah you know you do this all the calls and you know large language model learns from it mm -hmm. or trains from that and and maybe what we could do is like a little bit of you know Gen AI one hundred one just to mm -hmm. go through basic concepts yeah, like that, that's what, good, what yeah. is training really because it's not trained like on the fly right uh, but i think in, you need to understand where the data is stored if, if it is uh then you know but, right. but then you have like a fine tuning which is like one thing to do and mm -hmm. and just I, to kind of get an understanding overall what is this all about it's not like super complicated it's not as complex as evil probably everyone can follow it uh, but I think kind of understanding the basic concepts and and what the use cases are and stuff like that and where the risks mm -hmm. are, yeah, sure. all this like uh, you know, I, I have sort of... I have one use case actually which I was repeatedly thinking about, okay, uh, and that is actually consume have it have it trained being trained on uh, let's say the Siebel bookshelf or part of it, yeah, you know that's public that's public information so you could basically ingest it. <clears throat> simply upload the PDF. I, I don't know about the limitations of the Azure uh, AI. No, I mean, it's kind of scaling fine. Uh, uh, we can, can actually- Can, can it, it, can it ingest the, the entire bookshelf uh, probably? Like, yeah, of course it can. Uh, well, the thing is that it's sort of, again, the way how it works, it when, when you do the calls to large language model, they, they call 
they have this context window, right? Like how much information you can pass into right, it. Right, yes. Yes, and, and then, so let's say, if you want to do this Q&A, uh, you have to pass the text along with the user answer, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. obviously you cannot put like all the bookshelf. And that's why what happens is that when you do the embedding, you, you what is called like do chunking. So you cut yes, this PDF yeah. into pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the collection we have like not mm -hmm. one PDF, but it could have like uh, 500 records of it, even though it's SharePoint pre, is just one PDF. You, you have all the vectors pre-generated, embedded. And, and so then it's you can... just like reads PDF, which is like huge one, right? So mm -hmm. we say that, okay, the, the chunk size is, I don't know, like 2000 characters mm -hmm. or tokens. And then we, you know, split this PDF into these different pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And then we store it. And then when we do semantic search, yeah. because I, I, you know, yeah, we kind of, we find the sort of right page, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of pass this page and maybe some other page or like another page yeah. to, to LLM saying, okay, this is the question. We think that information is somewhere in these pages. You know, answer is the question yeah. using uh, information in these pages. And I, that's I, what happens. The, 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 the one use case I, I talked about in London was, for example, uh, I, I, I uploaded to, to Cloud AI, I uploaded 20 pages of the object, uh, Siebel object interfaces reference with some eScript in it. And even with those just 20 being 20 pages, we're capable of generating eScript, which yep. would be a great use case, let's say, to put in a copilot ish <laughs> help yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in Siebel web tools, right? So have it generate eScript or co put comments in your eScript and whatever. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we, about we can, more we developer can take experience. This, uh, like developer mm -hmm. turn as well. So, of course, I think it's kind of, say, at Idea Portigo, now we have like, two goals that we're trying to work on is like one is how to bring Gen AI to the end customers, but also how to start using it ourselves, like as simple guys, as yeah. custom developers, as testers and stuff like that. Yeah. And the, uh, I think this is like perfectly aligned with what you're saying as, as well, like how we can make sure that I don't know, Oleg or someone else who is working with Sibyl is super productive. And I heard that uh, from our friend Jason that they did this, uh, they kind of have Sybil bookshelf and uh, also release notes mm -hmm. embedded somewhere in that tool. And, and you say, okay, when was this ticket solved? Yeah, or yeah. is this ticket so... solved? And then they kind of get the answer. So they, they did what you wanted to do, but we can replicate it. So let's say, mm -hmm. I think, um, again, we can like spin like environment for you, for example, so that you could play a little bit with the, with the bookshelf and stuff. And yeah. and again, since mm -hmm. this, again, what what we have now is more like a, you know, very straightforward retrieval augmented generation. And and I mentioned like there are other techniques how you do it. Uh, it also depends like how do you actually do chunking and there are some other mm -hmm. like things you do. You know maybe you have user question and then you generate three different version of it, and then you get answers for all of the three different versions. And then you kind of select the best. So mm. there is like a more kind of advanced things. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's how it, you can do it. As, as I said, like increase more, the quality it's because it's the, not magic. It's just you know mm -hmm. there is a lot of this like try this, try that, try change the prompt. Is it working or not? It's it's really the the, the code generation, the, or let's say the well text generation, and then of course creating eScript code uh, for yeah. for Siebel mm -hmm. because that's like a eScript e is well documented within a few bookshelf guides it's a very limited set and if if that can be somehow used uh to, to the benefit of developers it would be just great right yeah yeah okay yeah, especially if it's sort of enforced like correct way of scripting right mm, yeah <laughs> a lot of, it's you know, incredible how many opportunities have opened since uh since the first llm came out yeah Yep, just effectively, you know, um, okay. 15 months, right? Yeah, it's, it's okay. a, has been a, a ride. So th thank you so much, uh, Yuris, and um, yeah, we'll keep, in, yeah keep in touch about the video. Thanks for inviting me, yes, and we, like, synchronize on the video, and um, mm -hmm. I hope that you will have, like, a boost in your YouTube channel, Alex. So. Yeah, sure. It's, yeah. 
you know, less people come here, more people come to YouTube, right? Right. To watch yeah. a little bit. So yeah, okay. And if okay, if anybody watched until now, <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, thanks much. And then, congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Happy Easter. And thanks, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Alex. Alex. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Yeah.